If you were to ask a Plan vs Zombies 2 noob or scrub what the hardest world is, you would basically always get the answer Big Wave Beach. Often followed with Scroctor Zombie or something of the like. It's a sentiment shared by the community at large, though some people believe dressing Marsh is actually harder, which I do agree with for the most part. This is irrelevant, however, as Big Wave Beach is also a fairly beloved world by top tier players. Yet, most mods won't put it as the final world. For example, in Old Versions of Cleis, it's only the seventh world, with Jurassic Marsh, For Future, and Neon Mystic Tour all placed after. Why is this? Well, because Big Wave Beach isn't actually all that difficult of a world. Yet, people still struggle with it. All the time. Big Wave Beach doesn't fight fair. That much should be clear, but how it doesn't fight fair? It's practically exclusive to itself. Big Wave Beach isn't hard because mechanics are impossible to deal with. It's hard because the game tells you how to get countered by the world. It's a world that punishes rookie mistakes, to an extent no other world has really seen since. Big Wave Beach fails to teach the player how to deal with it, and I think this is a very interesting design choice that I disagree with entirely. But before we get into that, let's go the basics of this world, eh? Big Wave Beach is a world based on American tiki culture, broadly. This is when surfing started to get super popular too. It's also one of the most questionable launches to me. It was pointed out to me at once that the game never says the player moves from each time period, so there's just randomly a beach here now. This is knowledge I was cursed with, and you shall now be cursed with too. Anyways, the gimmick of this world. Inspired from Plano Zombies 1's pool, the field will now be partially drenched with water. The tides will change constantly throughout the level, but the player will be told where the tides can head up to by a line of seaweed. Plants will die if the tide goes up and they aren't on a lily pad, so lily pad is mandatory to get anything done with Big Way Beach. And in use 25 sun, and a separately retouching plant, the planted water tiles, is a very notable problem. This world also has an ambush, low tide. Low tide will cause the tide to recoil and head backwards, but spawns a bunch of zombies on the tiles it used to inhabit. All just in tiles that never got close to, because screw you. This adds further danger of plants on lily pads or in the front line, as zombies can really just spawn on top of them at any time. Low Tide can also spawn any zombie, not just basics, including Dogantuars, which is about the most terrifying thing that vanilla can throw at you, frankly. Big Wave Beach has two sets of basics, though this doesn't really make much of a difference to anything. More notable are its four special zombies, which we'll talk about in the order they are introduced in. Snorkel Zombie is a returning zombie from the first game, and is very similar, being entirely submerged into water and only able to be attacked while they're eating a plant. The main difference in Plant vs Zombies 2 is that catapults are more readily available. In Plant vs Zombies 1, they can also be hit with catapults, though you get your first catapults after all water levels in the main game are done. It's not uncommon for mods to make them immune to catapults, though this isn't really a necessary trait. Snorkel is a zombie that will clog up your front lines, and encourages the usage of wall plants, such as Wall for Endurian, to drive them up. However, as Catapults and Plant vs Zombies 2 are consistently some of the best plants in the game, you may just want to bring Winter or something, and render the threat mute. I won't judge. Otherwise, Snorkel Zombie is actually my favourite zombie in this game. He friends the front line pretty often, and encourages the usage of walls, which the rest of the world does not. He's a minor threat of this world, the zombie that you can't ignore, but he isn't in the top 10 most dangerous zombies or whatever. I like him. Next up is my sworn nemesis, Surfer Zombie. Surfer Zombie is also debatably the most glitchy zombie in PV2 history. Like, he consistently breaks and doesn't work. He has two states, a serving state and a walking state. He'll spawn in his first one, moving at incredibly fast speeds for a zombie and ignoring all plants he flies over. Defeating him at this phase is best, though this can be a challenge due to his speed and an inability to be stalled by walls. Once he reaches the tide line, he will fall off and enter a second and more dangerous phase. Surfer's surfboard will now be held above him. This will act as armor for lobbing attacks though the splash from other catapults will hit him normally, which basically every catapult has. Anywho, when he reaches a plant, he will try to kill them with his surfboard. This is an instant kill on anything, and will spawn a surfboard on a space, which will act like a makeshift grave. He will also drop his surfboard on death, unless his death animation is somehow interrupted or changed. This drop is extremely inconsistent, and can really be about anywhere it wants to be, making him way more dangerous than needed though he does seem to prioritize plants over empty space. 
However, they broke him a while back. When he tries to place a surfboard on water, it will just instantly break and deal no damage. You'll also always try to attack slily pads behind him when he spawns in a second state, and will waste a surfboard on them. This makes him a lot easier to deal with, but if you can't deal him like this, he will just spam surfboards everywhere and wreck everything. Absolute pain, and he's incredibly inconsistent. His surfboard feels like it has a minus zone and just goes wherever, it's the worst place he can go. Moving on, Octazombie is the most hit zombie in the game. He will throw his octopi at the closest plant in his lane, and when it lands, the plant will be disabled. You will need to do significant damage to remove a squid from the plant, otherwise that tile will be entirely useless to you, acting like a surfboard or grave. Once removed though, the plant will return. Octo Zombie has a lot of counters, though they do have a habit of entirely locking down lanes, and generally are a big enough problem to be wary. It doesn't help that they have a lot of HP, essentially being in between a Conan and a Buggerhead, a lot for any zombie. It has a lot of cheese too, which I won't go into for the value of time. Finally, we have Fisherman, the worst zombie in this world. Unlike most zombies, he is stationary, akin to Cannon King. Unlike those, however, it's a much more active threat. He can cast his line, which will then grab in furthest right plant in the lane and drag it towards himself by a tile. This may seem minor, but there's a few things to keep in mind. Firstly, the furthest right plant is probably in a lily pad, and most likely is close to tide. If plant goes over tide, it will just die, instantly. And fishermen are fairly rapid too, there's not a whole lot of counters. Especially if you ignore seeding plants, the only two reliable counters of fishermen are infinite and moonflower's plant food. However, just being cannibal doesn't make him useless, because the player isn't exactly shown as a weakness. And this should be everything of note in Big Way Beach. Now you may have already noticed something very interesting about these zombies and gimmicks, but if you haven't, well, I'm going to play the chapter transition. Try to figure out what these have in common. I'll wait. Have you got yet? If you haven't, then all these zombies are really good at one thing. Damaging your front line. Even Tide and Low Tide build into this, being specifically gimmicks that target the front line. Everything attacks the front line. And this is a big problem for a reason you may already know. Because, well, people don't actually know what goes on the front line. You may have noticed in my footage, but I don't put my main attacks at the front. I put my sunflowers at the front. This isn't a mistake, but because it's optimal, and downright required to make Big Wave Beach a fair fight. Seriously, while Sunflowers are valuable, Sunflowers alone don't win you the game, your attackers do. In most cases, you can recover from losing a Sunflower, but can't recover from losing your main attackers, and by doing this, you're ensuring that, worse comes to worse, you can still fight back. This isn't nearly as relevant in most of the worlds, as while zombies friend front line, they tend to have significant or notable weaknesses. Chicken Wranglers and Explorer are countered by AoE, tanky zombies can easily be walled, and so forth. The only zombie in Big Wave Beach that won't directly remove or destroy your front line is Snorkel, who instead benefits immensely from being able to get free hits in as everything else in the world removes anything that can stop him. As a result, generally, the front line should be the plants you are most willing to lose. And for the most part, these will be sunflowers or other sun producers. And doing this increases your survivability significantly. Literally every zombie, ambush, and gimmick in this world becomes easier to deal with when your main offense is safe. Fishermen keep dragging your weakest plants instead of your strongest. Octos won't tangle your most valuable plants, and you will be able to remove the squids with raw DPS. And both snorkels and surfers will be eating and attacking plants without decreasing your damage. And don't get me started on low tide an ambush that otherwise absolutely will just remove everything you've ever loved. The game just never tells you this. Plant Zombies 2 never told you to put your offensive plants in the back, especially at the time, and a vast majority of people won't. The game doesn't exactly tell you to place on turn either, it doesn't say anything on some flat placement to my knowledge, but it's clear a lot of newer players will place them in the wrong places. They really didn't make much an attempt to explain this or encourage this, so I have to question why they proceeded to make a world so built around this. Now yes, players should be expected to figure out some of this stuff on their own, which is very clear to me that most don't. If you go into a wiki for instance, you will find that the majority of players do place their producers at the back. And these are people working on the public resource, and clearly have communications with at least a chunk of their community, so it's clearly fairly unknown. 
they really should have had, at minimum, Dave bring it up as an option as part of his crazy ramblings. It's almost as if they don't want a player to know about it. I wonder why. Now this isn't necessary to beat Big Wave Beach, though for the most part if you don't do this, you'll need some very specific plants. Most notably Rotobagger, because Rotobagger is a plant that really wants to be played in the front, is cheap enough that losing it isn't a great problem, has sky high DPS, can float over tie so Fisher takes a while to break through, can counter ambushes and deals Octos fairly effectively, just in general Roto is insane in Big Wave Beach. Also Infinite. Infinite counters Fisherman only, which is enough to totally negate Big Wave Beach. Without Infinite, you really aren't going to get anywhere in some levels. <clears throat> Big Wave Beach 28. <clears throat> the player doesn't really have a way to figure this out alone, though, as whilst logical the shield works this way, it's absolutely not something a players will accidentally find out. Unless they have poor deck building skills, I guess, and just chose for an Infinite and a level Fisherman. I don't know. This is an issue because the zombies feel bounced around this. Especially considering when Big Wave Beach was released, this feels pretty much intentional of how they are meant to be fought. Both internet, but also just placing your attacks at the back. Heck, the lone screen now tells the player to put their attackers in the back. Twice. Telling you to replace these sun producers with offensive plants, and to leave spaces in the back. The loading tip was added later to development. Literally, like, seven years later or something at this point. So I'm not totally sure on this but it certainly feels like this world is designed to push your plants to the back. If not, then this world is designed to be incredibly difficult compared to mostly everything else in the game for some arbitrary reason. Not much better. Though, weirdly, this feels intentional to me, because the rest of Big Wave Beach follows suit. Both plants, and even certain levels that, while it isn't nearly as bad nowadays, used to be a very real problem for similar reasons. Let's start with an overview of the three, usable, plants of this world. Bowling Bulb, Banana Launcher, and Guacodile. All three are incredibly powerful in their own right, but all require a lot of skill to use effectively. Bowling Bulb is a very potent damage dealer that can clear lanes, take names, and otherwise beat the ever-loving god out of swarms of zombies. It does, however, require a lot of instant support to keep itself going, especially plants like Ghost Pepper, which are crucial to using this guy effectively. Banana Launcher is straight up one of the best plants in the game. With a very high fire rate, incredible control, it can essentially do anything you would ever want a plant to do. It's very powerful and very potent, with its only major weakness being that it requires a user to have a good eye for when and where to fire it. This mostly includes knowledge of how waves progress, which I won't go into here. Gokodile is insanely strong, just not if you use it how PopCap tells you to use it. Gokodile has an incredibly short cooldown, meaning it can be spammed to the heaven and back. So, use an insta, never use a shooting part, it's practically worthless, and instead use it to manage enemies across the field constantly. It's an insanely good plant when used this way, capable of removing most threats whenever they are needed to be removed. All of these plants are easy to write off as worthless, but all of them are plants that come out to be incredibly effective at high tiers of play. But, well, only high tiers of play, and require a lot of skill to make effective in any real capacity. While I wouldn't call this a problem, it makes Big Wave Beach as a world super unapproachable. But it also makes Homing Fistle a weird plan to have here in any capacity. While I can buy GMs at any time, it's weird to have one so geared towards weaker players, due to some logic I use in this video, essentially being incredibly easy to use, so associated with a world that encourages players to not act this way. It's certainly strange, especially when you consider Big Wave Beach 16. Big Wave Beach 16 is a very infamous level, and it's not for no reason. You barely get to planting to survive, and you get overwhelmed quickly. Except if you know how to play this level, that's not at all how to play it. Conveyors in PZ2 give you less plants the more plants are on a conveyor, so counterintuitively, you should be spamming plants down off a conveyor as soon as they appear. By doing that, your lawn will look like this, not this. Seriously, this mechanic is so dumb, and I only know it exists because I've made conveyor levels. I'm very unsure if this was the intended way to play it or whatever, but it's a pain either way. Still, it's a running theme that a lot of levels straight up seem unfair unless you approach it a certain way, and whether intentional or not, I can chalk it up to poor teaching all the same. As another note, Big Wave Beach 28. It sucks. Seriously, I can't find a strategy to this level that doesn't use infinite plant food. It's madness, and it really should have been reapproached at some point. 
but whatever. I guess power-ups exist, which are probably the actual intended strategy. This is a mobile game after all, this is practically expected. It's one of those things where it seems intentional to me, but it could also just be down to general mobile game design. After all, games like this make money if a player struggles. I say I'm more likely to buy plants such as Cold Snapdragon or Grape Shot if they are doing poorly, spend money on power-ups, and so forth. It's a very unfair challenge unless you already have to deal with it. Slammer Zombies 2 monetizes itself in its early stages by players being enabled to play the game well, and provides several mechanics to get the player out of these positions at a cost. Uh, oh, sorry, except for power-ups. Clearly, they are accessibility features. Obviously. Big Wave Beach is a very interesting world, and I don't really know what to make of it. The more I think about it, the more strange a world truly becomes. On one hand, it has some fantastic specials, which are all threatening in their own right, being the only world of four specials, as opposed to usual five to six, that really feel full. But it's also one of the worlds that, arguably, stands against what I believe games should stand for. I find a lot of mobile game design incredibly manipulative, and find them truly horrifying. And the more I think about this world, the more I see it as a game keeping a player in the dark to monopolize off their poor skill. That doesn't sit right with me. One day, I will make a video covering this properly. Otherwise, let me know what you thought of this video in the comments. I've got some ideas I want to do more similar to this, and make sure to subscribe, it's pretty cool. I've got a ton of videos down the pipeline, just so finally turning off this freaking Namori challenge I did ages ago. I, I need to finish this off for sure. And there's certain to be at least one video you'd want to watch. Otherwise, this has been Creeps, and have a good one.